معلش حبيبنا تقرا هناك حتى لا نزعجك ولا تزعجنا جزاك الله خير بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله وبعد um, Before I start I was going to say feel free to use chairs uh, not because I'm giving you يعني, uh, a hint that's going to be a long class or anything like that but just in case if you don't feel comfortable to be sitting down you can sit on the chair it's, it's very very uh, fine for me um, let me start by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, uh, he is the one who deserves all the thanks for giving me the opportunity and the courage to make this commitment for a, a long term uh, commitment actually to teach in this uh, beautiful place that it has always been a place of knowledge and da'wah and activism and uh, uh, spirituality uh, hundreds and thousands of people have benefited tremendously from this place and the gathering that take place of this blessed masjid the main center uh, one of the oldest and the first earliest masjids that we had in Houston I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and reward those who establish this place and help us as a community to continue make this place a blessed gather place and blessed masjid and I would like to extend my thanks to especially Dr. Arsalan and many of the brothers and sisters who encourage me uh, to come and to commit to a class in this part of town um, and I'm very excited about it uh, very happy to be with you here and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep this class going and beneficial and growing for both of us it is important to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always to guide you to ilm in nafi' wa amal in salih that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you to a beneficial knowledge and righteous deeds and there is nothing more blessed in your life than having these two a beneficial knowledge because there is a lot of knowledge there is no really benefit from it you know there is a lot of information that we have and daily we process it every day especially those on social media you know a lot I mean, you know, I don't benefit anything from it, especially those who follow everybody's Facebook status and Twitter feed and like in news. There's a lot of, I mean, as an Imam Shafi, Allah once said, قال هذا العلم به الجهل به علم. <laughs> Imam Shafi once, Allah said about something, he said, not knowing this is knowledge. <laughs> what he means by that, he said, not knowing that piece of information, it's a null. Why? Because you have a limited capacity. So t- putting part of your capacity to learn or to know that, it will take away from that beneficial knowledge that you could have used your brain or your memory to, to understand or to study. So no doubt, one of the most beneficial knowledge is to study Al-Quran wa Sunnah, is to study Sharia al Islam, is to study the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And no doubt, the righteous deeds is a result of a beneficial knowledge. And that's why this is a very interesting topic, which is as-salat. And this is, will be studied from a book it called Bulugh al-Maram. And uh, it's a collection of hadith, and I will explain this a little bit more. But I want to tell you that, uh, off the bat, from the beginning, that these ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam focus on one subject, which is as-salat, and it's a chapter of a big book. It called Bulugh al-Maram. And the reason I'm starting with as-salat because I spend about a year explaining the first chapter, which is focused on the purification, and that was the first chapter in the book. And this is something I finished in Clear Lake Islamic Center, and it's online available. If you go on YouTube, you can listen to the whole entire uh, series. Uh, some of you guys uh, attended it already. Tomorrow and Wednesday, I still teach in Clear Lake Islamic Center, but I move to the last chapter of the book, which is the book of Al-Adab, Etiquettes and Manners. 
So uh, today as salah, tomorrow we do uh, the etiquettes and adab and manners, and hopefully as months and years goes by, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the umr, the uh, health and uh, life, we'll be able to cover more chapters inshallah ta'ala. And I will uh, follow the same methods that I did with the previous chapter, which is an um, intermediate level. It's not a very basic, nor it is a very complicated and very detailed and uh, to the uh, level which can turn people sometimes off or, or, or you know, kind of lost in, in these discussions. I will try my best to make sure that you develop certain skills as a student of knowledge because ilm al-shari'a is a very interesting knowledge and it's a science and it's based on a very methodical, very logical way of understanding texts and analyzing them. And that's something I like to include in my teaching to make you a critical thinker. That's why we will be analyzing opinions, debating some of the opinions, uh, understanding some of the terms and the structures of the scholars, how they basically consider this is an authentic narrations versus weak, how they debate an issue uh, among themselves. So you can understand how the ulama rahimahullah and the Muslim scholars think. And the reason for that, because it's so important to have trust in our religion have trust in our history, have trust in the work of our forefathers and to be proud of them. A sharia is just not a text that memorized and developed without understanding, without uh, critical thinking and, and, and a deep thinking about it in analyzing these texts and that you will see when you study the fiqh or the ilm, uh, al-hadith in general. Um, also, uh, during this study, inshallah ta'ala, I would like to share, you know, a few things here and there. It depends on the mood <laughs> of the teachers and the students uh, and the time. A uh, few things about different type of Islamic science. Uh, because when you study ilm al-hadith, it's like you study tafsir. I always say, ilm al-tafsir, the the science of tafsir or ilm tafsir is like a fruit salad. You will find all kind of fruits, mango, you know, banana, apple, you know. The more you put, the, the, the better the fruit salad is. That's right. It's not one type. The same thing, a tafsir in it, aqidah, fiqh, hadith, Arabic language, uh, literature, history, you know, everything you can imagine. It comes in ilm tafsir And the same thing, the ilm al-hadith when you study the text of the Prophet ﷺ if this been understood you will understand now that it's impossible for someone to claim him or herself a mufassir unless that person master all fields of sharia it's immediately a fake person who said Oh, I'm not good in fiqh or hadith or usul fiqh, but I'm good in tafsir. You immediately know that this is a fake mufassir. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's just a very thin layer who knows things and relate to you. But the real scholar of tafsir, that's why tafsir is on the top of the science. Some people think tafsir is one of the earliest things that you start with. No, tafsir al-Quran is a result is the outcome of mastering several field in Sharia. Explaining the text of Hadith is the outcome of mastering several, ta- several subjects in Islam. And when you master these subjects and you became good and understand, have a good understanding of them, you will have the ability to make tafsir, you have the ability to interpret the Quranic text or the Hadith text. And no doubt that this is something serious. And we should be any student of knowledge who put himself in a position to explain what the Prophet ﷺ meant or what Allah meant. That's a very big claim to make. And uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide me to say what is correct during these uh, classes. Um, you know, the sci- this book that we're studying, it's part of a science that's called uh, Kutub Ahadith al-Ahkam, 
the books of the collections of ahadith al-ahkam, the ahadith that relating to Islamic rulings. So this is talk fo- focused mainly on the Islamic rulings in every area in, in Sharia. And the ulama rahimahumullah will gather all these ahadith and put them in order, put a title for each group of ahadith to cover one chapter in fiqh. So it will be easy for the student of knowledge to understand what these rules are based on, what these rules are based on, what's the proof behind these rules. And for me, there is always two important benefits for this kind of books. Number one, it's important to connect the people with the evidence. At one time in our history, the focus was to connect the person with the, with the scholar. So all what the person care, what Abu Hanifa said, what Malik said, what Shafi'i said. But they don't care at all about why Malik said that, why Abu Hanifa said that. What's the proof for Shafi'i for saying that? So what happened through, uh, through history, the people basically forgot about the evidence and they became more connected to the human beings, to the scholar themselves. And scholars are means, are not goals. Al-alim is a tool to achieve the result. And it's so important for us always to connect people with the source of the religion, the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And to connect them with the ulama, because the ulama are the tools that they allowed us to understand these texts. But it's always important for us to be connected to the source. And that's the benefit of studying such books versus just studying a book of fiqh. Okay? Number two, one of the benefits of these kind of books that you do need to deal with some of the things that have no basis in religion, that it might be exist in some books of fiqh. Yani, there are things in the books of fiqh is based on hypothetical you know, scenarios and very rare to happen. Okay, it's, they are beneficial, but beneficial to certain group of people, but not for the masses. And sometimes you find things that has no basis at all. Actually, it's became a waste of time even to go through them. Uh, uh, like for example, you will find some scholar will put certain conditions and rules about going to the bathroom. Okay, and there is no proof for it at all. For example, which leg that you lay on when you sit in the bathroom, you know, what, and certain details about how to clean yourself, there is no proof for it at all. The, why, this is in my opinion, something that save our time from going into these areas, when you stick to the hadith, because the hadith doesn't go to these things uh, that people came up and added to the religion, which is not part of it. But, if this been said, studying a book like Burugh al-Maram also have disadvantages. Number one, that it doesn't help you much as a student of knowledge to understand fiqh. Why? Because if I'm going to study, for example, about the how to pray, okay, the, the way to perform the prayer, or the ruling of, or the timing of the salah. When you study the books of fiqh, it's very straightforward, very precise, very straight to the point. The Salat al-Dhuhr start from this time to end to end in that time. Salat al-Asr, and, and he give you the bottom line, what's the ruling is, very simple, very straightforward. Then he give you all the five pra- prayers. Then he will give you all the khilaf, in which salah there is a different of opinions, and who said what. But when you study a book of hadith, what happened? One hadith will talk about only three salat, the timing of three salat. But he doesn't mention the rest of the five salat. Another hadith talk about fajr only, but doesn't talk about isha. And so you will not have the full picture. You have to collect all these hadith together in order for you to have the full picture of the subject. And that sometimes when you study hadith, you kind of lost. You don't get the full pictures of the, uh, of the ruling. Also sometimes there is one hadith, but this hadith is abrogated, or there is another hadith to explain it. So if you don't collect all the related evidence, you cannot get lost. That's why we always advise the serious student knowledge in fiqh, they must study fiqh from books of fiqh, and they add to it the books of ahadith al-ahkam. 
But in order for them to have a full picture of the subject, you have to read it from a book of fiqh. Another disadvantage, that sometimes you have to repeat yourself. Like for example, last week I talk about hadith, and this hadith mentioned the timing of Salat al-Fajr. But two weeks later, I talk about hadith, talk about completely different topic. But in the end of the hadith, he talk about the time of Fajr. So I have to go back over that subject. It's kind of there is repetition, and sometimes can be a little bit boring. Um, all books of hadith al-Ahkam, the collections of the rulings a hadith are mainly based on 14 references. Okay, you don't need just in case somebody interested. Let's see if you guys can think of the references. Every collection of hadith, the rule, the hadith of ruling, hadith al ahkam are based on mainly 14 sources, resources. 30 main books that all the ulama take these hadith from. Can anybody think what these books are? Say that. Al-Bukhari, very good. Muatta Malik, very good. Ah, not really. Huh? Muslim, Sayyid Muslim. It's easy if you say Bukhari, Muslim. At-Tirmidhi. Uh, yeah, Muslim, Imam Hud. Mm-hmm. And at Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, An Nasai, Ibn Majah, the six books of Hadith basically, okay, and you add to them Muattal Imam Malik, Mustal Imam Ahmad, and another book, it's called Sunan al Bayhaqi, one of the main references. Sayyid ibn Hibban, also a very important book in this regard, Sayyid ibn Khuzayma, and two important books. One it's called Al Musannaf al Abdul Razak. And Al Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba. And these two books, Al Musannaf, the two Musannafs, the most important about these two books to understand that these books cared a lot about the narrations of the companions and the successors. So if you ever want to know what the Sahaba said about this topic, you go to the books Al Musannaf. You will find what the Sahaba, what the companion, the successor said about that. And also there's another important book, it's called Sunan Ad Daraqutni. Um, so these are mainly the, 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 the 14 books that I found most of the books of a hadith al-ahkam basically took their a hadith from there is many books like bulug al-maram and the most important one al-imam ibn daqiq al-eid is a, a scholar in egypt dies 702 hijri wrote a book it called al-ilmam bi hadith al-ahkam and also there is another uh, spain scholars called ashbili uh, also wrote another book and one of the most famous book uh, that I was thinking about teaching actually instead of Bulugh al-Maram it's called Umdatul Ahkam Lil Imam Abdul Ghani Al-Maqdisi Rahimahullah Umdatul Ahkam the good thing about it that most of the ahadith of it uh, or he based his book in what in Al-Bukhari and Muslim only so you don't need to worry about is this authentic narration or not. So it's a very straightforward. All the hadith that he collected in the Islamic rulings are taken from Al-Bukhari and Muslim. There is also a very famous book and it became famous because of the explanation of it. Explained by a scholar, his name is Shawkani rahimahullah. He wrote a book called Nail al-Altar. But the original book it called Al-Muntaqa min Akhbari al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi al-Ahkam. Even though Shawkani rahimahullah twisted the name just to make it rhyme with his book. He called it Muntaq al-Akhbar. Otherwise, that's not the original name, but he just play with it a little bit. Anyway, uh, the book that we have, Kitab Bulugh al-Maram, so you understand what kind of book we have here. Uh, it's a book uh, It's called Bulugh al-Maram. What's Bulugh al-Maram means? What's the word Bulugh al-Maram? Reaching your goal, your dream book. If you have a dream book about, if you can dream of a book that collect you for you all the ahadith about the Islamic ruling, that's the book. That's like your dream book. So, Bulugh al Mara. Okay? And uh, Rahimahullah, the one who wrote this, a great Shafi'i scholar, that's why. In this book, you will find that he always support the Shafi'i madhab. He followed the Shafi'i way of writing the fiqh even. He, he made the order of the book exactly the way the Shafi'i wrote their books. 
and uh, the half of uh, Abil Hassan, Abil Fadl, uh, uh, Ahmed ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah ta'ala. Ahmed ibn Ali ibn Muhammad al-Kinani al-Shafi'i, he's from Gaza originally, or Qastalan from uh, Palestine, but moved to Egypt, born, raised, died in Egypt, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he said in his intro, when he wrote the, the, the introduction for his book, he said this book is a, is a summarized book. I summarized the ahadith, the ruling of ahkam. And he said, حَرَّرْتُهُ تَحْرِيرًا بَالِغًا I took good care of it. I wrote it very carefully. And this is important because sometimes we found out some of the scholars who explain this book, he all, they always criticize Ibn Hajar. They said, Ibn Hajar wrote this hadith and he said, it's in Al-Bukhari and it's not in Al-Bukhari. It's in Muslim and it's not in Muslim. And he said this, this. Ibn Hajar said in the beginning, I was carefully, I put this book carefully together. So when we see that this narration, he said it's in Al-Bukhari, and we don't have it in Al-Bukhari with us. The problem with Ibn Hajar or with us? If Al-Bukhari, if he said this hadith in Rivat Al-Bukhari, you go to Al-Bukhari, you couldn't find it in Al-Bukhari. What's, where is the problem here? No. Some people criticize Al-Bukhari. said, oh, because he writes from his memory or whatever, maybe he miss basically located. But that's not true. The problem is not an us and him. The problem on the copies that we have. The copy that we have from Al-Bukhari is not identical to what Ibn Hajar rahimahullah has. Al-Bukhari has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies. Okay, what you have in your hand today is just one of the one of the copies of al-Bukhari, and I mean by that, you might have in another copies of it, another manuscript of it has more narrations that does not exist in others. There is nothing in what we have al-Bukhari never wrote; it is all written. But maybe what we have is incomplete. That's why even we have today different narrations for Al-Bukhari. And in some of these narrations, you will find some words are exist in that manuscript, but does not exist in the other one. And we have many examples like this. Are you guys familiar with a book it's called Fath al-Bari? Fath al-Bari. If you ever read in Fath al-Bari, which is explanation for Sayyid al-Bukhari, Ibn Hajar explaining the text of Al-Bukhari. If you ever happen to read in that book, in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, Ibn Hajar said, the hadith above saying this, and you look, there is no hadith. He talk about something is not in the text. Why? Because the kabi of al-Bukhari that he's talking about is not the same one that you have now in Fath al-Bari. What you have now in Fath al-Bari is a kabi that we call mulaffaq. Sheikh Abdul Baqi, rahimahullah, who is a great scholar in Egypt, brought al-Bukhari and he tried his best to match what Ibn Hajar talking about. But in so many, in, in tens of places, it didn't match. Or he will say words in hadith that's not exist in the text. Why? Because he used a different manuscript, a different copy of al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. So I'm saying this because I found it very common that people kind of attack Ibn Hajar rahimahullah. And now he is, he knows what he's doing. And he is, he really wrote this book very carefully. And he said rahimahullah ta'ala, يَسْتَعِينُ بِهِ الطَّالِبِ الْمُبْتَدِئِ I made this for the beginners. It's an excellent reference for the beginners. وَلَا يَسْتَغْنِ عَنْهُ الرَّاغِبُ الْمُنْتَهِ And the one who is advanced in knowledge, is still needed. So he helped... When in other words, like intermediate level. Anyway, uh, this book has been a focus of the scholars for a very long time. The first time this book was ever been printed, guess which country printed it? Can anybody guess where this book printed it first? I'll give you three choices. Okay? Egypt, Turkey, India. Why? You guys, India or someone? Why India? Actually, you're right. It's India. In uh, Laktau, is that how? Laktau or Laknau, maybe I don't know. Laktau, Ta is just how it's written. Anyway, um, 
this was printed more than 182 years ago. The first time this book was ever came printed out was 182 years ago. It's about 1837. That's very old. And by the way, all books of hadith published in India. The, the, the India, we are in great debt to India. India is the country where it saved Ilm al-Hadith. There is hands down. All the asanid of the hadith goes all the way to India, then go back to, it start in Middle East, go to India, then go back to Middle East. It, it, they, India did an amazing work in preserving hadith in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi It's an amazing work and it deserves, you know, several lectures actually. And the second print for it was in Lahore, again in India, and that was 1888 Hijri. Uh, sorry, uh, 1888 uh, and 1305 Hijri. Um, so this hadith, uh, he sometimes he narrates the hadith in a short, like he doesn't bring the whole entire hadith, he only narrates for you the point from the hadith. The hadith one page, he will only give you one line, because that's the point he wants from the hadith. And that's a very good thing that he did, rahimahullah. Also, he make a comment how authentic the hadith is. Sometimes he made a comment on explaining some of the words, in explaining the, the judgment of the scholars, uh, mentioning some of the narrators. He, he, he basically put a lot of good points, rahimahullah, after he mentioned the hadith. Also the way he put the order of the book, it's amazing, and the collections of the hadith is very, very unique. Um, I based my explanation to you guys here based on several books. Uh, number one, the most famous explanation for this book by a great scholar from India, from uh, India, from Yemen. His name is Sanani, rahimahullah, Amir al-Sanani, who died um, 1099, not a long time ago. Sorry, who died 1768, 1768, which is Hijri uh, 1182. Uh, and he wrote a book it called Bulu uh, Subul Salam Sharh Bulu uh, Al Maram, and the most famous explanation for this book, four volumes. Also, there is another book that I used, uh, and it's very unique because the author wrote an amazing point. His Indian scholar, his name is Siddiq Hassan Khan, Rahimahullah Al Ghanuji, Al Bukhari, and um, he died 1890. Uh, and he, he wrote a very, very good book it called Fathul Alam Sharh Bulugh Al Maram. Also, one of the references that I always use an explanation that I tend personally in person part of it with the Shaykhana, our teacher, Shaykh. Uh, Muhammad al-Salih al-Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala and his book is printed now it's called Fathu Dhil Jalali wal Ikram bi Sharhi Bulugh al-Maram and it's a very big explanation for the book also um, one of the book that if you ever want to prepare for the class that will be my first recommendation to you to read it's very simple Arabic language very straight to the point I wish I can stick to this book only because it's very simple very straightforward very easy uh, by Sheikh Abdul Bassam, Rahimahullah, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Abdul Bassam, his name is called Tawdih al Ahkam, Sheikh al Bassam. Uh, also, I study this book, Bulugh al Maram, with the, one of my teachers, Sheikh Sheikh bin Baz, Rahimahullah. So I have some of the comments of his Sheikh bin Baz, Rahimahullah, on some of the ahadith that if there is a need, I will share it with you. Also, I study this book with another Sheikh of mine. Is a great scholar, the chief judge, the chief justice in Saudi Arabia uh, at one point in his life, Sheikh Saleh al Haydan, Hafizahullah uh, Ta'ala, is one of the great scholars that I have learned from him a tremendous amount of, of knowledge. Uh, also, Sheikh uh, Salman al Oda has an explanation, but mainly on the book of Tahara and the Siyam, and a little bit talked about as Salah as well as a good reference. Um, so this called Kitab al-Salah. The second chapter in Bulugh al-Maram, and it has 18 sub-chapters. So as-Salah has underneath of it 18 sub-chapters. It contains 382 hadiths. 
So hopefully by the end of this chapter of Salah, you will study 382 hadith related to as Salah. After that comes a chapter, it's called Kitabul Janais, the chapter of funeral. And in this Kitabul Salat, the sub-chapters are something like the timing of Salah, the Adhan, the conditions for the Salah, the way to perform the Salah, the Khushu' in Salah, Sujood al uh, Salat al Jama'ah, praying in congregation, al Imama, uh, leading the prayer, um, the prayer of the traveler, the prayer of the uh, Jumu'ah, the two Eid prayers, the Kusuf, the Eclipse prayer, a chapter about uh, the prayer during time of fear and war, um, pray for rain, did you say Eid? Was, and the last chapter, okay, and prepare yourself for this, the last sub-chapter in the book of Salah, it's called Al-Libas. Cloth, clothing. And when we reach there, I'm going to ask you, why you think he mentioned this as part of As-Salah? He's not talking about the cloth that covered awrah, but because he mentioned this already in the condition of the Salah. He talked about clothing. When he was talking about Salah, I'll tell you now, and I'll ask you about it later. Because part of the etiquette of the Salah is to dress well for the Salah. It's to dress nice for the Salah. So that's why he talked about how to dress nice, what is recommended, what's not allowed to dress, what are the type of clothes that is disliked for the Muslim to wear. And he put that in the Salah. And that's something also many of the fuqaha do that. So if you ever want to look for a chapter in a book of fiqh about dress and, and even the condition of dress and clothes and what's allowed, what's not allowed, recommended, not recommended, where do you look? You look at the end of the chapter of the salah. Many of the books of fiqh have that subject in the end of the chapter of the salah. Um, there is no doubt, my brothers and sisters, it is so important for us to care so much about the concept of as salah. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, and this hadith reported by Tabarani, bi isnad la ba'sabih, an acceptable hadith, by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, and also Imam Ahmad, and uh, an Imam uh, al-Bazzar from Abi Dhar radiallahu an, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, for the hadith al tawil he said, part of a very long hadith, he said uh, to Abi Dhar, وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ الصَّلَاةَ خَيْرُ مَوْضُوعِ And you should know that as salah is the most important subject. It's the most important subject. Is the most important thing to be engaged in. The most important, the most beneficial thing to do, and to study, and to learn, and to focus on. If you can do as many salah, do. A salah is the second pillar in Islam. And it is the most important action that you can do with your body. It is as the Nabi Wasallam said, is the main pillar of Islam. And that's why I encourage myself and my brothers to make this class an inspiration for all of us to care more about salah, theoretically and practically. Theoretically by learning about it, by honoring more, honoring it more. That's why the ulama wrote a book like Al-Marwiz rahimahullah, has a great book, it's called Ta'zim Qadr Salat, the importance of honoring the salah. A salah is something so serious, so big. Yani, look at yourself. And I'm talking about, because if this is in your mind, in your heart, the salah is, is so important, it's so serious, it's so critical. It is so important to the extent that in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the adhan is called adhan, not iqama, the adhan is called sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the, even if we explain that as an iqama, if the adhan is called, Aisha said, he leaves the house as if we don't know him and he doesn't know us. And before that she said, when he comes to the house, he used to help me, help me fixing the house, cleaning the house, and he worked with me, and he joked with me. So interact. But when the salah comes, تَقُولْ كَأَنَّهُ لَا يَعْرِفُنَا وَلَا نَعْرِفُهُ as if we don't know each other. Because the salah is more important than anyone else. The question is, is this house salah for you? 
is when the salah time comes that everything in your mind can freeze. You know what? I feel not comfortable. Salah, salah. I need to pray. And I feel so many of us so relaxed. A salah comes and goes out. The time end or about five minutes to end and we're still dragging our feet. And that's wrong. We need to have that, you know, sense of urgency and importance of the salah. As salah, Allah mentioned it in the Quran more than 60 times. 60 times. As salah and as zakat together most of the time and as salah by itself. So that's why I think this is a very uh, interesting topic to focus on. Hopefully it will lead this theoretical knowledge to practical knowledge. Which is, means, I mean by that, ilm nafi' leads to righteous deed. Which is we increase the amount of salah that we do. I'll give you an example. If you want Malik, people before Jumu'ah. Can a nas قبل الجمعة الموطة مالك has been narrated that people during Umar ibn al-Khattab time before the imam stand up for the khutbah people used to pray two rak'ah, two rak'ah, two rak'ah until the imam comes up they're taking advantage of that period of time to pray as many salah as they can Ibn Umar sometimes pray 12 rak'ah before the imam start take advantage you have a moment, just pray two rak'ah Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, the author of the book one time he went to his Library. He was the in charge of the library of Cairo, the biggest library in the Muslim world at that time. Can anybody knows why it is the biggest library in the Muslim world at that time? Just keep it from the top of your head. Where do you think the biggest library in the Muslim world will be? Baghdad, Spain, Qurtubal, Andalus. But neither Baghdad or Spain has any library anymore. Why? Because Baghdad destroyed by the Mughal, the Tatar, and Spain destroyed by the, the Crusader. So these two libraries destroyed. So most of the book, and Jerusalem and Syria and Damascus, there is also threat, which is the Crusader. And the whole entire center of the world became what? Cairo, Egypt. That's why they have the biggest library in the world at that time. So anyway, so he was in charge of the library in, in Cairo. One time the door was locked and he forgot the key. So he brought a carpenter to unlock or to open. Then the student said, then he stopped praying until they fixed the door. Want to take advantage of them? Stop praying to Raqqa to Raqqa until they fix the door. Because he understand, take advantage of time. Kitab um, salat the book of As-Salat. Why al-ulama call the chapter kitab? Why they call chapter kitab? Kitab it means book, that's right. But kitab in Arabic language, aslul kitab, al-kat, al-dam, when you gather things together. So kitab, it doesn't mean necessarily something written. That's why Allah give every messenger a kitab. It doesn't mean he give him what? an actual book. He didn't give Musa and Isa and uh, Muhammad an actual book. He said, hey, this is your book. No, he gave him a message. But that message we call kutub, kitab. Why? Because kitab in Arabic language doesn't mean necessarily something written. It means gathering. You bring things together. Tadum shay ila shay. So the message is a collection of Rules, collections of informations about the law, about the day of judgment, about what Allah loves and He hates. That's why we call it kitab, book, a message. So that's why we say kitab salah it's a collection of rules and hadith about salah. Okay? You have kitab tahara, kitab siyam. So it's the collection of information or a hadith or rulings in regard to this topic. As salah in Arabic language, comes from the word or the root for it, it means a dua prayer. As-salat means to pray, to supplicate. And that's known in the Arabic language, even prior to Islam. There's plenty of poetries, you know, mention as-salat, and it means you supplicate, a tadu. Um, and also some ulama said dua bil khair al-istighfar, but originally goes to you supplicate for something. 
And in Islam also, the word salah linguistically means to pray. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah At-Tawbah, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah said in Surah At-Tawbah, take from their money, donations and charity, that this donation and charity will purify them, will raise them, okay? And صَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ يعني when they give you their sadaqah, Make dua for them. Salli alayhim yani ish, make dua for them. Not to say, Allah Akbar, it's not janaza. To pray janaza, no. It means make dua for them. When someone do that's why, whenever we have a fundraiser, you know, and he somebody donate money, some people said, Allah Akbar. I have no problem to say Allah Akbar, but the sunnah is to make dua for the donor. What I got from Allah Akbar? I personally got nothing. But if you make dua for me, I got the dua. You see what I'm saying? So that's why when someone donate, you should make dua for the person. May Allah accept your money. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless what you have given or what you have left. Okay? That's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana idha atahu qawm bi sadaqatihim, and this hadith in Bukhari, when people bring their charity and their donation to him, qal, Allahumma salli ala ali bari fulan. Ya'ni, ya Allah, salli ala this so-and-so person, so-and-so family. وَأَتَاهْ أَبُوْ أَوْفَى فَقَالَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَىٰ آلِ أَبِي أَوْفَى يَا الله صَلِّ عَلَىٰ آلِ أَبِي أَوْفَى A salat from Allah, it means praising. Okay? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise Abu Awfa. Also, in Nabi صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ في صحيح مسلم, and this is a funny story. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم if somebody invites you for food and you are fasting, what you should do? Qala Nabi Sallallahu accept the invitation. And when you are there and they bring the food to you, قُلْ قَالَ Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi فَإِنْ كَانَ صَائِمًا فَلْيُ إِشْ قَالْ وَإِنْ كَانَ صَائِمًا فَلْيُصَلِّ إِنْ كَانَ مُفْتِرًا فَلْيَطْعَمْ وَإِنْ كَانَ صَائِمًا فَلْيُصَلِّ If you're not fasting, eat. And if you are fasting, make salah. So this brother, mashallah, they brought the food. And he said, Jazakumullah khair, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Why? He said, didn't Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that? He said, if you are fasting, go pray. No, pray here, it means supplicate. Yani make dua for them. It's not make, yani pray, and you go, so you guys eat, I'm going to pray until you finish. No, that's wrong. And that's true, true story, by the way. طيب, what is as-salah in this the linguistic meaning to make dua? The what as-salah in sharia means, sharia sense in Islam, in Quran and Sunnah. As-salah means, هي عبادة, an act of worship, ذات أقوال وأفعال, that it contain, this act of worship contain statements and actions. مخصوصة, a specific statements, a specific things to say, and a specific movement, you do at specific time. A specific. So, Allahu Akbar. You can say, Alhamdulillah. A very specific wording. What to say, and movement. Standing, ruku, sujood. It's not like up to you to figure out a prayer. You know, say, Allahu Akbar. No, it's Allahu Akbar. So it's very specific statements you make, very specific motions and movement that you do, at specific time, dis- prescribed by the Qur'an and Sunnah, these specific times. So dhuhr, asr, maghrib, isha, so forth. Okay? It starts with at-takbir, Allahu Akbar. وَتُخْتَتَمْ taslim, And you end it with, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. That's how the ulama, rahimahullah, defined the salah. And there is a, anytime you make a definition of something, we call the definition must be jami' mani'. Must be a definition that cover all the topic completely, and mani' that it will prevent that definition to apply to something else. Like this definition cannot apply to zakat, cannot apply to hajj. But you might say, Sheikh, hajj, 
a specific statement, a specific movement, at a specific time. This definition applied to Hajj? No. Look at the last thing we said. Start with takbir and end with taslim. That will exclude Hajj. That we call it mani. It will prevent other basically meanings. It will be very precise. Make it very precise. طيب. Always when we make a, a, a technical definition or a definition of sharia, it always connected to the linguistic definition. What's the connection? Because as salah from the beginning to the end is about dua. It's about praising Allah. It's about supplicating. As salah it's a, it's, it's a form of dua. That's why the ulama rahimahullah can make dua during the salah all the time. What's the ruling of the salah? As salah is a fard ayn, is an obligatory upon every single Muslim. Okay, we'll, we'll end. As salah is an obligatory prayer upon every Muslim by the consensus of the Muslim scholars. And there is an overwhelming evidence for that in the Quran and Sunnah. And in ulama rahimullah, all of them agree that as salah is must upon, there is five daily prayers, must upon every single Muslim, every 24 hours, five only. They are must. Everything other than five is volunteer. That's why a man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, Inna Rasulaka Zaam, your messenger to us claim that you saying that Allah prescribed upon us five prayers every day and night. Unless I volunteer. He said, yes. So that's a very explicit hadith, shows you that any salah other than the five daily prayer is recommended. From that, al Jumhur, the majority said, Salat al Witr is not wajib. Why? Salat Sunnah al Fajr is not wajib. Why? Because in Nabi Sallam very clearly he said, yes, you have five prayers every day, must. And anything else is what? Volunteer. Okay? Also from this, the ulama said, it's wrong what some people do. They pray like some women do. They pray Jumu'ah, then they pray Dhuhr. Why? They said, oh, because women are not supposed to pray Jumu'ah. So they pray Jumu'ah and Dhuhr, they double the prayer. Wrong, because that means they make six prayers wajib upon them. It's impossible. It's only five prayers every 24 hours. That's why I remember when I was traveling from Australia, coming back, I prayed Jumu'ah. And I prayed, I was there on Friday. I left Friday Asr, Australia. But I arrived Honolulu Thursday. <laughs> okay, so I arrived Honolulu Thursday. So the people ask me, what should we do? You know? How can we pray? Or you travel from one distance. It's very interesting when you come back, you know, backwards like that. So I said to them, you only have one Jumu'ah every seven days. You cannot have two Jumu'ah every seven days. So there's no Jumu'ah for us. We prayed it. And also, you can pray six Salah. If I prayed Dhuhr, I prayed Dhuhr. I can't pray Dhuhr again. Only one Dhuhr every 24 hours. Only one Asr every 24 hours. You see what I'm saying? In the, in the regular days. We're not yet in the, in the jail time. Um, <laughs> so there is five daily prayers obligatory upon every one of us. Um, we'll end at nine, inshallah. Um, so some of the early sects, it's called Khawarij. And in India, there is a group started it. Uh, it became a movement in India most likely. Otherwise, uh, the idea started in Iraq, started in Egypt. Then it became a movement in Egypt. They call themselves al Qur'aniyun, The Qur'anis who believe only in the authority of the Qur'an, don't believe the Sunnah. They claim that as salah only wajibah three times a day. And some of the early Khawarij said that. They said only three times a day you have to pray, not five. But this is, goes against the consensus of the Muslim Ummah. And they claim that the Quran said that وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَكْبِكَ قَبْلَ طُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ وَقَبْلَ غُرُوبِهَا وَمِنْ أَنَاءِ اللَّيْلِ They said that the Quran said make tasbih before the sunrise, after the sunset, and in the middle of the, in the night. So three times. But that's 
the sunnah is very explicit and there is other verses as we will learn inshallah next week mention other timing than these three the salah was made obligatory three years before hijrah three years before the Prophet migrated to Mecca the salah became an obligatory upon the Muslims anybody re- remember when was it in the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this very unique way to make the obligation of the salah that you risen Muhammad sallam all the way to the heavens and guess what no middle no Jibreel in the middle Allah directly told Muhammad sallam about the obligatory prayer what that means to us how important this is can you imagine Allah will take Muhammad all the way to the heaven just to tell him about the obligation of the salah and not only that, it was made obligatory 50 times a day. I have a question. When you repeat something many times, what that means to you? It's important. That's right. It's important for you. That's why you do that. Why you look at your phone so many times, like an average person look at his phone 200 times a day, or like a day? Um, every one hour why because it's important for you 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 usually do things a lot repeat it a lot because it's important to you and Allah it is so important for him a salah that he wants you to do it that many times a day so Hajj once in your lifetime and it's important Siyam every year Zakat every season or every year based on the thing that you give zakah on it. You see, it's things that is like, but Allah wants you not only to do it once a month or once a week. No, He wants you to do it 50 times a day in the beginning. You guys know what 50 times a day means? Every 25 minutes a salah. That's how often Allah wants to see you praying. He would love that, but He knows that this is hard. So Allah reduced the 50 to 5. The 50 to 5. And He said, أَمْضَيْتُ فَرِيضَتِي What I have said will be true. I will not change my word. Allah is saying, it is 50 in reward, but 5 in actions. And in other words, you still get the reward for 50 salah, but you only ask to pray 5 times a day. But you will get the ajr and the reward as if you did the 50 prayer. Can you imagine how important, how important this that Allah made it 50 times a day because He knows that you need it. And as salah in the beginning in Islam, by the way, as salah was only two rakahs. There is no salah more than two rakah. Two, 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 you pray two. Then after that, Allah changed the rules. He made Dhuhr 4, an Asr 4, and Maghrib 3, and Isha 4, but Fajr remained 2. But in Nabi Shasalam extend the recitation. Zidat fi qiraatiha. As Aisha said. When we travel, it goes back to the original status, which is two rakah for Dhuhr, two rakah for Asr, two rakah for Isha. I think Maghrib was always three. It n- never changed. It was not two in the beginning. Um, so, here, uh, Al-Quran order and encourage us to care for the Salah. Some ulama said there is more than a hundred verse encouraging us to care for the Salah and to warn us from neglecting the Salah. So I have only one minute left. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّا A generation comes after them, and these generations follow the desires and they miss the prayer. The scholar said, if you see from yourself that you're not consistent in your prayer, that means that you're following your desires. 
Look, maybe there is a sexual lust, desires that you're fulfilling it in haram way. Or a desires for the wealth and the money that you're doing in haram way. Or whatever desires. There is something, there is some lust that you so attach to it. And as a punishment for you, for following that forbidden desire, that you start missing the salah. Because missing the salah is harm no one except you. That's why al-ulama rahimahullah, and that's maybe a fa'idah we end with it here. Al-ulama rahimahullah said that if someone miss a salah intentionally, you know what, intentionally, I did not pray maghrib. I just didn't pray maghrib. And fajr time, I remembered. I keep the intention didn't pray fajr. Somebody woke up 10 minutes before the fajr time finished. You know what, washed up, and just relaxed, dragging their feet, until fajr time out. Can he pray fajr? Anakida, I purposely didn't pray dhuhr until maghrib time. I said, you know what, I didn't pray dhuhr. Ah, okay, let me pray. You know what, I didn't pray the whole day, and in the end of the day before I go to sleep, let me pray the five time prayers, the five prayers at once. <coughs> You will come inshallah to know, and I'll explain this more to you, that the strongest opinion that I do believe, you can't. You cannot make it up. But my point is not the issue if you can or you can't. Those who said you cannot, قالوا ليس تفضلا بالعقوبة ليس يعني you can't make it up, not because we want to make it easy for you. That's a punishment for the person. A punishment that the person would never be able to make that salah for the rest of his life. That you lost that opportunity that you're never going to make it. Even though the hadith is weak, but it kind of support the idea that the Prophet said, or been claimed, or been reported that he said, whoever miss intentionally or leave intentionally one of the days of Ramadan, he would never be able to make that day, even if he fast the whole entire year or the rest of his life. He cannot make that up that day. It's very, it's very powerful. And I'm saying this because I saw especially among youth, among some of the sisters and brothers who are young or old, they don't care. Sometimes I tell my kids, for example, hey, there's only 10 minutes left for Fajr to end. Okay, okay. 10 minutes, if it's gone, it's out. You can't make this up. It comes after you dress and you brush your teeth and you fix your hair and put your clothes and dry. And after I finish all this, I'm ready, I go to pray. The salah is done. The time is out. You can't do that. That's not allowed. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, next week we'll uh, continue with... Um, Several issues before we start to the, the first hadith. We're going to start with first hadith next week. But um, as an introduction, it's important for the salah. We'll talk about uh, the issue of the ruling of leaving the salah. And you will be uh, amazed by uh, what's the real actually position of the fuqaha when it comes to leaving the salah. And what's the position of the early scholars and how... Zayn al-Din al-Iraqi and some of the Maliki scholars said, it's a hypothetical, imaginary situation to think of a Muslim who don't pray. <laughs> Al-Iraqi was saying, that's an imaginary scenario. It cannot be exist. He said, this is something people like, imagining a Muslim who don't pray. It's something impossible for them at that time. And I'm talking about, 700 years after the Prophet time. They cannot imagine a Muslim who don't pray. He said, that must be some wild imagination. Because we never heard of a Muslim don't pray. Allah al-Musta'a. What do we say today? I'm sure each and every one of us knows someone who don't pray. Don't care about praying. So, we'll talk about this and what's the fuqaha rahimahullah said about this. Um, and... Um, um, we'll also be talking next week, hopefully hear from you about uh, some of the reasons why people miss salah and how can we people be consistent in their salah. 
And, um, you know, we'll talk about the mawaqeet to start with the timing of the salah and the first hadith. Inshallah, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Aas, radiallahu anhu, wa an abi. Okay, thank you. Any questions before we go? Yes. For, uh, um, you know, for uh, for those who are online, inshallah ta'ala, we'll take your questions as well. I'll ask one of the brothers here to follow on Facebook and be able to take the questions, those who follow us online. So, I'm, so uh, before we break for a question and answer, I just wanted to thank the chef for this wonderful introduction and encourage, so now we know what the stage is, we know what the book is, and we know what topic we'll be covering next week. As he just mentioned, the reasons why people miss out on the prayers and how people can become consistent in their prayers. This is a really, really important topic. And I'm quite confident that, alhamdulillah, I'm happy to see so many new faces, uh, faces that I haven't seen in a while. I'm quite sure that we can actually double the attendance for next week. And the reason is uh, not because we want to double attendance for no reason, but the Prophet says that that the one who calls people to goodness is like the person who does it. And being that this topic is so important, and as uh, the Sheikh mentioned, I'm sure we all have people that we know who are struggling with their prayers. We should not just be concerned about coming and attending the good ourselves, but that we bring people to goodness always, that we be a community of da'wah. Some people have to be dragged, no problem, drag them, throw them in the trunk, bring them. Uh, your family members who you can bully, bring them. Everybody that you can. I'll never forget something that I heard from Imam Salah during Black History Month. You know, the nation of Islam grew so fast in the 70s and the 60s. And the theology isn't a correct theology. In fact, when you study it, it's actually strange that so many people accepted this theology. But Imam Salah said that when they would come to the masjid or their center, their temple, they would always say, Did you bring any fish with you? Did you bring any fish? And what was a fish? Do you know what a fish is? A fish is a person. Did you, did, you come, did you come by yourself? Or did you bring somebody with you? And so they had a culture of always bringing people with you. And so imagine when you bring people, you bring your fish to the sunnah of the Prophet That's the best to bring a fish to. So inshallah next week, come with your fish inshallah. Agreed? Zagmul khair. So it's a very uh, descriptive, because fishing, it doesn't guarantee a fish, but it guarantee what? A chance, an effort. Effort. So that's the point. You put an effort. Yes. Uh, I'm going to make a rules, inshallah, from now on. We, we have to finish kind of 10, 15 minutes before 9, and we finish everything by 9. Okay. Inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. Go ahead. Whoever had a question. If somebody missed, he was not practicing, didn't fast Ramadan, uh, can he make a lot of du'a? No, this person we say, number one, make tawbah. Repent to Allah, ask Allah to forgive him. That's all what you need to do. And the second thing will be, is to make a lot of volunteer fasting. Same thing with the salah. If somebody missed a lot of salah in his lifetime, and we don't ask them to repeat the salah again. What do we ask? Repent and do a lot of what? Extra salah. And make sure that you consist in your salah. Perfect your salah right now. And Allah forgive you what happened in the past. Yes. So we learned that there cannot be two salah, two of the same salah today. Um, and two groups that are. So what if one prays Isha at home, and a Muqad coming to the masjid now learns that there's congregational salah? Are they not obligated to pray the congreg- with the congregation that salah? You're not obligated to pray. The question is, if I prayed Usha at home and I come to the masjid and I find them praying, what should I do? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered the masjid and he found two people in the back. And he said, why don't you join the salah? He said, we prayed, Ya Rasulullah. We were traveler and we prayed already, Aisha. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, join us and it will be a volunteer for you. Qal fahiya lakuma nafila. 
So the joy. That's why Mu'adh radiallahu anh, and maybe you will get the hadith in, the, in our study, that Mu'adh radiallahu anh used to pray Isha with the Prophet Then he goes back to his people, his tribe, his neighborhood. They have a musalla, they pray Isha together. And he will go lead them in Isha prayer. So he lead them in Isha prayer as a volunteer for him. But he pray Isha with the Prophet But in that case, if one were to not pray with the congregation, even in volunteer, with the intention of volunteer, are they... Send for now. Shana Shabbat Ithimeen said it's must, but the majority said no. Yes. We make up a lot of volunteers, even Sunnah al Dhuhr, you make it up. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made up Sunnah al-Dhuhr. They said like, uh, it's like uh, when you say that you have to make it up with her, there's... No, you don't have to make it up. You don't have to make up Sunnah al-Witr or the Witr prayer. You don't have to. It's, it's a volunteer prayer. But it's a very, very highly recommended for you to pray Witr. It's a very, very highly recommended for you to pray Sunnah al-Fajr. It's the most highly recommended prayer. So that's why we care for it. Oh, if they overslept, they have the option to make it up, and they have the option not to make it up. It's like any sunnah. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من نام عن حزبه أو نافلته Whoever overslept or was sick, and he missed the hizb, the, the, um, the designated amount of Qur'an citation in the Qur'an that the person do every day. Or any volunteer prayer, because if you're sickness or traveler or sleeping, you make it when you wake up, when you make it when you became healthy, when you make it when you arrive. So you can do that. You, you still you can make it up basically. Yes. So Shay, you didn't you did not pray twice when you were coming from Australia to Kuala Lumpur. Mm. What did you do when you were traveling back to Australia? I also pray for, make sure that I pray five times because you skip. So in every twenty four hours I have to pray five times. It doesn't matter what the name of that twenty four hours is. So you understand what I'm saying? Because you skipped a day. Like I left Wednesday, but I arrived Friday. The whole Thursday is gone. It does not exist, but it doesn't matter for me. What matters for me is 24 hours. So I calculate every 24 hours, five times, five prayers. How do you time that? 24 hours from the day I left or the time I left my destination. So, you, in another word, I have to calculate that to divide to divide it by five. As I imagine, as if Zuhur, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and I don't remember now if I had to pray Maghrib in the daytime, something like that. It was kind of weird, but it's 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 a very uh, it's became like a Dajjal time. The, the four Messiah, the day will be like a week, a day will be a month. So Nabi said, You have to calculate and to divide. So let's say if you calculate how the salah today, every eight hours there is a salah, or every like seven hours between this and this, or six hours. So you calculate it this way and you just add it, divided by 24 hours. So if you pray like at Asa in Australia, and when you went to Honolulu, let's just say it was Fajr, so are you saying that you? Now, if I if I if you leave, you follow. You see the sun. If the sun's still up, that means there's no night came to me. Coming back from Honolulu, coming back from Australia. This one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here's my. It's not. Can we just hold on to this? I'll I'll talk to you on the way out. Yes. No, because this is kind of out of the subject, and I want to keep the question to the subject mainly. So, I made a promise that if I'm going to teach here, I have to leave early, because I can't be late. 
because I still have like 40 minutes drive. Yes, go ahead. Can you raise your voice a little bit? Mm -hmm. Do you need to change position between the obligatory prayer and the sunnah? If you're going to pray the sunnah right after the fard, yes, it is sunnah recommended to move, to move the process. Allah encourage that. But if you're going to separate between the two prayer with dhikr, adhkar, or dua, you don't have to. Uh, Taslim would be the wrong word. Uh, what would say your question? Just explain it. Don't use terms. You finish the salah. When you finish the salah, you say, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. You finish the salah. Any prayer. Any prayer. Yeah. So any salah, any prayer that you do. Yeah. Any prayer that you're going to pray. It starts with Allah Akbar. Then you go. Then you just sit in the end. This Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaykum wa You finish. Now I finish my salah. I want to do like volunteer prayer after that. If I'm going to do it immediately after then stand up and pray, you have to change the position. Or it's sunnah to recommend it for you to change the position. But if no, I'm going to say, say subhanallah, subhanallah, ten times, alhamdulillah, I talk to someone, read Quran. Yani just, there is a break between them. No, uh, you don't need to change the position. Change the position, change the where you're sitting. Like I'm sitting in this spot, I move to another spot. Sorry, to change your spot. To move to another spot, to move to another place to pray. So let's say I prayed here. I said, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. I'm going to go pray. Like I just prayed Aisha. I don't want to pray too soon over Aisha. The ulama said it will be recommended for you if you're going to immediately stand up and pray your sunnah, the Turak Aisha, to move to, to the side. No, no, if you say salam alaykum wa rahmatullah from Isha prayer, and you're going to immediately stand up after you said salam to pray the sunnah, al Isha, which is two rak'ah, okay? It is sunnah to move to another spot, to move to another spot to pray. But if you're going to say the adhkar, and you're going to make dua after you finish your salah, you don't need to change your spot. You can pray in the exact same spot. Yeah. No, the Prophet Sallam, no, it's not the witnessing. No. Uh, the change is because the Nabi Sallam said so she will it will not look like as if they are connected salah. That's the reason. No, no, it's true it's correct, but it's not mentioned for this regard. It's not mentioned in regard to this particular ruling. Subhanakam the Kishana Stavrik. Uh any questions on the way out? Sorry.